We'll get started in a minute if you find a seat. Welcome. We're here tonight to talk about trees. <laughs> trees have different meanings to all of us, and no one put it quite so beautifully in as many writings on, on trees as Walt Whitman. In an entry from the winter of 1877, still recovering from a stroke that had left him severely disabled, the 66-year-old poet describes his workout in what he called the gymnasium of the wilderness. He writes, a solitary and pleasant sundown hour at the pond, exercising arms, chest, my whole body, by a tough oak sapling thick as my wrist, 12 feet high, pulling and pushing, inspiring the good air. After I wrestle with the tree a while, I can feel its young sap and virtue welling up out of the ground and tingling through me from crown to toe like health's wine. Good evening, my name is John Conti. I don't necessarily advocate wrestling with trees, but I can't help but be inspired by the imagery of the essential connection between man and nature that that passage illustrates. I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight to this special event co-hosted by the Greenwich Tree Conservancy, the Greenwich Land Trust, and the Greenwich Library. As Vice President of the Tree Conservancy and a lifelong advocate for trees, it's my pleasure to open this evening for a panel discussion on our role as neighbors, homeowners, and land stewards in the care of our urban forest. We're blessed with an abundance of natural beauty in Greenwich, and central to much of that beauty is our local forest and the protection that its canopy provides. Since its inception in January of 2007, the Greenwich Tree Conservancy has been a driving force for the tree care, planting, and preservation of that forest. Together with the Land Trust, we form a powerful alliance for environmental stewardship in this community. Born out of a shared concern for the recognition of the critical role trees play in our health, our sense of place, and our basic quality of life, the Greenwich Tree Conservancy has made significant strides in reinforcing that narrative. Planting thousands of roadside trees, fostering good care policies, acknowledging the importance of trees to our residents through awards, awareness programs, and gatherings for celebration. The Tree Conservancy is strong and growing stronger every year. As we delve into the detailed subject matter tonight, we're equipping ourselves with the knowledge for each of you to become a stronger advocate for trees. The knowledge, this knowledge empowers you to act as stewards and to be spokesmen for our silent friends ensuring that the lush greenery that defines Greenwich remains vibrant and thriving for generations to come. Before we begin, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you the Tree Conservancy's new executive di director, Kate Chikevich. Kate will be following in Joanne Messina's footsteps and blazing new trails of her own as we open this new chapter in the evolution of the Tree Conservancy. Kate comes to us from the Bruce Museum where she managed the Seaside Center. Kate's contributions to environmental education and awareness are noteworthy. She has authored numerous scientific articles and her research will undoubtedly enrich our own educational and outreach in initiatives here at the Conservancy. Moreover, her experience in managing naturalists, interns, and volunteers speaks volumes about her leadership and organizational skills. Needless to say, we're very fortunate to have her join us. Kate, would you like to say a few words? Please come on up. Thank you so much for the introduction, John. Um, I could go on at length about how excited I am to be here tonight and to be the new executive director of the Greenwich Tree Conservancy. I could also talk a lot about how inspired I am by the 17 years of amazing accomplishments in this town that the Greenwich Tree Conservancy has already had under the leadership of Joanne Messina. But if I talked about all those things, we'd probably be here all night and we have an event to get to. So instead, I'm going to talk about just how delighted I am to see so many familiar faces in the audience. 
people that I've either worked with um, or just met during my eight years working at the Bruce Museum. In fact, I see two people sitting up front who are common, who are pretty familiar faces at Fred Elser for Sunday Science, which I used to hold monthly. One of the best things about getting this job, I think, is being able to still work in this amazing community with such passionate, dedicated, and hardworking people. I'm so grateful to be still be able to be part of this community, and I can't wait to protect our town trees with you. So thank you so much again. You'll be seeing a lot from me, and please enjoy the rest of this event tonight. Thank you, Kate. And now back to our program for tonight. I'd like to extend a special thanks to our co-sponsors at the Greenwich Land Trust and to Kathy Sehe of the library for this amazing facility and the staff and setting this all up. And especially to our esteemed panelists for traveling and, ex and sharing their ex expertise with us tonight. We'll be hearing tonight from Jack Swatt, president of the chapter, Connecticut chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. We'll be hearing from Alan Fenner, uh, expert consultant and certified arborist and tree risk assessment uh, consultant for the Bartlett Tree Company, and our own uh, tree warden, Dr. Greg Kramer, superintendent of Parks and Trees for the town of Greenwich. Their insights are invaluable in guiding us towards better practices in tree care and land conservation. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight, Mr. Jack Swatt, president of the Connecticut chapter of American Chestnut Foundation. Jack. After our speakers, the panelists will sit and um, will open the floor to questions. Jack. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, see if this works here. Um, there we go. I'm going to talk tonight about uh, the American chestnut um, and the uh, chestnut bark, bark disease. Um, Back in the, um, especially in the early um, colonial days, it was estimated there were four billion chestnut trees thriving in the east. Uh, some early colonial surveys of trees show that one out of every four trees in the forest was a uh, chestnut tree, about 25% of the forest. Um, the trees uh, were dominant in the canopy. They grew straight and tall uh, and were fast growing so they could reach the uh, upper canopy and uh, became so dominant. Um, and they were also, um, uh, huge trees that uh, lived for several hundred years. Um, they were so big they were called the redwoods of the east. Um, it was a very important commodity for a lot of the early settlers as well, um, as well as the, um, the Native Americans. Um, it provided food for both animal and people. Um, the wood was rot resistant, so it was great for lumber for building. Um, and the bark was also high in tannins. It was used a lot for the tanning uh, for the leather industry. Um, everybody's probably heard of the um, uh, carol about roasting chestnuts on an open fire. Um, so a lot of the um, early settlers or farmers in the Appalachians would go out in the fall and collect bushels and bushels of these uh, chestnuts uh, as they were falling from the trees and sell them um, where they would be brought by train to the cities so they could be sold for uh, roasting. So it was a nice uh, second uh, um, um, way of making money for the, uh, the Appalachian people. Um, it was also used highly for a lot of different foods, not only roasting, uh, but it was also chopped up and put into um, 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 stuffing for the holidays. Uh, it could be um, put into soups and um, uh, salads. Um, and it could also be ground into flour and used for baking. Um, a lot of the wildlife used to be dependent on chestnut. Um, you probably know about oaks only producing mast every one or two years, but chestnut used to produce uh, hundreds of uh, nuts every year. Um, and as we mentioned, the wood was uh, useful at the, the, before the blight came through. Um, the electrical uh, poles or electrical systems were being put in across the country and they were used for the poles as well as the railroad ties. And it was also easy to work with, so it was used to make a lot of musical instruments and furniture. Um, and it was called the cradle to grave tree because chances are when you were born, you were put into a cradle made of chestnut and when you died, you were placed in a uh, casket of chestnut. So why don't we have chestnuts uh, prevalent in our forest anymore? 
Um, back in the late 1800s, uh, they started importing a lot of uh, um, ornamental trees, including uh, Japanese chestnut and Chinese chestnut from Asia. And when they imported, they believe it came in on some of the Japanese chestnuts that were imported into the New York City area uh, that carried with them a fungus. And it was first found to be infecting American chestnuts at the Bronx Zoo in 1904. Um, and from there, it spread dramatically throughout the whole Appalachian Range. Um, I don't know how well you can see it there, but the, uh, I don't know if my laser pointer is working. Eh, not too good on that screen there, but in the New York City area, you can see 1904, and each red line is another uh, five or ten years after the initial spread. Um, they tried cutting trees down for miles, thinking that would prevent its spread, but uh, since it's uh, an airborne spore, uh, it just traveled past the areas they cut. Um, and it just wiped out uh, forests that were uh, heavy with chestnut. Um, so this is what the blight fungus looks like. Uh, you can see the auger plate up in the uh, upper right hand corner showing the, uh, the fungus growing and you can see that orange pigment to it. Um, and on the cankers on the tree, uh, the one on the left, you can see that the first sign of a canker is when the bark splits and expands, and usually there's a, an orange pigment to the, uh, the bark inside the cracks. Uh, it eventually forms a larger canker and forms uh, spore-producing uh, spore bodies that also have that orange pigment. Um, but now the American chestnut is not extinct. Since the fungus only attacks the stems, um, it doesn't kill the root systems. So it continually sends up new sprouts, um, and then eventually the blight fungus will attack the sprouts, knock them back to the ground again. It's just constantly cycling between sprouting and dying back to the ground again. But we call that functionally extinct. Um, so after the blight went through, a lot of um, uh, nurseries began selling Chinese American and Japanese American hybrid trees to replace all the uh, chestnut trees that people had lost. And a lot of times, even here in Connecticut, that's what we find still growing today in people's yards when they say, oh, I have a real healthy chestnut tree growing in my yard. So uh, there's an example of some of them that were grown in somebody's backyard. So, um, and also, um, nut growers were experimenting with some of these uh, Chinese American and Japanese American chest uh, hybrid trees even before the blight struck. So when the blight came through, they thought they can get the resistance from these Asian trees since that's where the, the blight fungus evolved. Um, and some of those early experimenters were even from right here in Greenwich. Uh, Robert T. Morris and W.C. Deming, uh, I think were physicians from this area, and they were involved with the Northern Nut Growers Association. Uh, they started experimenting with some of their crosses, but they convinced the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station to study chestnut uh, blight and see if they can develop resistance with hybrids. And uh, Dr. Graves was uh, one of the first uh, scientists at uh, the Agriculture Experiment Station. And he uh, created um, hundreds of hybrid crosses and he planted them in his yard uh, on property just below Sleeping Giant, uh, what's now Sleeping Giant State Park, and um, also at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station. Um, then in um, the uh, 19, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 1983, uh, we our founder, Dr. Charles Burnham, uh, created our foundation. Uh, and we are, our goal is basically to develop a hybrid um, uh, chestnut tree that can, we can return back to the forests of the Eastern United States. It'll have to grow straight and tall like the American tree, but contain the resistance uh, to fight off the blight. And his plan was to take a Chinese American hybrid and back cross it through three generations with American trees so that we'd end up with a tree that's 95% American and 5% Chinese. And then we would forward cross it through several more generations to amplify the resistance genes. And um, at each generation, we would inoculate the trees with blight fungus and test them for their blight resistance. Um, and then basically grade the cankers and the ones with the showing the most resistance to the, the, the smallest cankers we would save those trees and call the other ones and only let them reproduce for the next generation. Um, basically, he, um, when he developed the plan, they thought there were only maybe three genes responsible for blight resistance, 
but through experimentation and further genetic research, we found there's more like several dozen genes. So all that back-crossing probably diluted out too many genes, and it's not as successful today as what we'd hoped for. But we're still working on refining it, and hopefully we'll get to the point. We still have some very resistant trees we're working with and trying to breed just with them. Um, biocontrol is another method for fighting the blight fungus. Um, um, hypovirulence is a condition where the blight fungus gets a virus and makes it weaker to infect the trees. Uh, this is what happened in Europe with the, uh, the blight fungus that uh, evaded Europe. Um, so it's a weakened form of the blight. Um, the problem is it doesn't spread readily from tree to tree, so you can treat one tree with it, but you can't cure a forest. Um, and biotechnology, uh, we started working with um, um, SUNY ESF, the Environmental Science and Forestry uh, uh, School, um, to collaborate with them to look into transgenics to develop a blight-resistant tree. Um, and just a little background, how the blight fungus kills the chestnut tree is that it secretes a high concentration of an acid called oxalic acid that kills the bark and then the blight fungus eats the dead bark. And once it gets down below to the cambium layer, and encircles the tree and girdles it. Um, so they proposed using a gene that breaks down oxalic acid from the wheat plant. And when they inserted it into chestnut germ cells and grew trees from them, they were showing resistance better than uh, Chinese chestnut was. Um, and since this is a single gene, it will also be inherited to 50% of the uh, progeny uh, on average, rather than the you know, several dozen of the Chinese genes having to uh, um, pass them down to the next generation. Um, so one problem we've had with the, um, the transgenic tree, especially recently, there's been something in the press where um, we've had a little problem with the, the tree that they developed. Um, the gene for oxalic acid is within the coding region, and um, the gene that was inserted also has to have an area at the beginning called a promoter region. It's kind of like a switch that tells the plant to um, um, encode for that, uh, that enzyme, uh, or transcribe the, the genes for that enzyme. And they used a um, promoter region um, that is always turned on. They basically wanted to have a tree that would show proof of concept that we can um, put the oxalate, oxa oxalate oxidase gene into the trees that it will show resistance to the blight. Um, so with that promoter, though, there is some uh, metabolic uh, demands on the tree that um, make them grow a little smaller. Um, but they also have developed a second line of transgenic tree, which they're calling Darwin, which uses a wound-inducible promoter. And using the wound-inducible promoter, um, it will only turn on the transcription of the gene for the oxalate oxidase when the tree suffers a wound to the uh, bark. So this uh, has a little lower metabolic demand on the tree um, and hopefully will produce uh, healthier trees. Um, we've also done more research into the um, um, genetic code of the uh, Chinese chestnut trees. And we also have some areas where we think are blight-inducible promoters. So what we hope to do is develop these promoters, working with um, other scientists, um, uh, some down in Georgia that are working on this, University of Georgia. And we can develop transgenics where we'll insert the oxalic uh, oxidase as well as other genes responsible for resistance from the Chinese chestnut. And um, that will produce a tree that will only turn on those enzymes when it, uh, it actually gets a blight infection. And that would be uh, something that would be closer to the natural way that trees fight off disease. Um, since these trees are clones, we need to um, outcross them several generations to get rid of the original genes so they don't um, um, cross with each other and cause inbreeding. Um, so what we're doing right now is trying to conserve as much of American chestnut, uh, wild American chestnut germplasm and we're trying to uh, put them in these germplasm conservation orchards. We have several throughout the state. Um, basically, we plant 10 seeds from 10 different mother trees um, so that when they grow tall enough in uh, good sunlight, they will flower and cross-pollinate with the uh, flowers from the other mother trees so that we're conserving the genetic diversity of the species. So um, hopefully when we get to the point where we have healthy transgenic trees, we can outcross them with 
and do further research with them. So um, that's the end of my presentation. We'll get to uh, uh, questions later, uh, as we mentioned. Um, but next, we'll have uh, Alan Fenner um, from Bartlett Tree Company and come up uh, to talk to us about beech leaf disease. Good evening. It's great to be here. It's great to be among uh, folks who love trees. Uh, just a, I was telling Jack earlier a, a story that um, when I was a kid, uh, my parents always kind of put us out in the uh, outdoors. And one of the earliest things that I remember, and I think it was probably one of the reasons I became an arborist, um, my father used to take us on a boat. And I grew up in Rhode Island near Jamestown. And we would go out on a boat to one of the islands off of uh, the mainland there, in between Jamestown and the mainland. And um, there were several large chestnut trees growing there. And, and we'd bring out bushel baskets and bring those uh, chestnuts back in. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't roast them on an open fire, but the stove was good enough. So, uh, but the great thing about trees is that it brings us to a connection with uh, not only a connection with nature and the natural world, but it, it joins us in time, too. So, you know, where Jack was talking about trees and, and something infected them back in 1904, and, you know, we're 100 years later and we're still seeing some remnants of those trees. And to me, as a little bit science background oriented, uh, tells me, well, there's still hope for, for that to repopulate. So without any further ado, I'll figure out what I can do to go on here. Um, I put together uh, this presentation with a colleague of mine, Dr. Beth Brantley, uh, who is actually one of the uh, PhDs that is working at uh, Bartlett Laboratories on uh, finding a, uh, a way for us to combat and slow down this uh, disease that we refer to as beech leaf disease, which um, those of you that own American beaches um, know in terms of uh, as of about 2018, 2019, it was first found in Connecticut uh, or discovered in Connecticut. And uh, it's actually been in the United States since around 2012. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what it is and how we manage it right now with the research that we have available to us. Um, when you think about 2018, 19, that's very, very few years that we've been looking at this disease that attacks um, the tree and affects it throughout the growing season. So beech leaf disease is basically uh, caused by a nematode, which is a worm-like organism, uh, very kind of microscopic. Uh, and Basically, the damage occurs to the leaves and the buds. Uh, a lot of folks will say, oh, it's, is it in the roots? Do we get it up from uptake through the roots? Do we get it from, you know, uh, something infecting the, from a mechanical injury in the, in the stem or the trunk? No, it's basically, uh, it's in the buds, comes out of the buds, and as the, the bud turns into a leaf and uh, becomes larger, uh, we see more and more of the, uh, the associated damage. And that um, tree death we find can occur within, uh, well, within a few years for a small tree, uh, an understory tree, or within eight to 10 years for a larger tree. Uh, here's some, some microscopic slides of uh, um, the actual nematode and some of the parts there, but uh, I won't get too, too much in, in, in detail about that. But uh, where did it come from? Well, it uh, seems like uh, a lot of species, you know, uh, we can bring back to origination in uh, Asian origin. However, um, we found that in Japanese beach, uh, Fagus granata, uh, that there was blister galls associated on the uh, 
on those leaves, and, but there was no documented mortality from that particular uh, instance. But uh, in Connecticut, those of us that have beech trees have probably, and have seen the damage here, um, can associate when the leaves are fully erupted, uh, they'll see this associated damage with it. Um, so initially when it came into the country there, it, it was documented in Ohio in 2012. And um, it basically stayed there, kind of did not really move or wasn't really discovered or encountered anywhere else uh, until 2018, when um, in Connecticut there, it's depicted in, the, in that uh, kind of midge blue shade uh, there, and uh, have pretty much um, been finding it uh, progressing northward. Oh, oops, I guess I, I missed the slide there, uh, or got taken out. But those stars indicate um, where it's been, it's actually been documented in those areas where we see stars. Uh, and it's actually gone farther up into, uh, into Maine. So uh, someone I was speaking with earlier, you know, uh, I think it was John, uh, we, we mentioned that it was a little bit cold hardy uh, in that regard. So how does it spread? Well, essentially, um, right now our, our research is telling us that it's likely that it's wind driven by the wind, uh, rain, splash, small animals, gravity, um, Far distance, the best theory that we have is uh, could be mechanical means in terms of folks bringing firewood other places. Uh, however, um, feeding of uh, infected buds by goldfinches who love to feed in that area, um, it's speculated and uh, that they're one of the carriers. So essentially, when, when do we you know, see it? When do we treat it? Um, the symptoms appear usually right at bud break. Uh, and that's a fully erupted leaf. You know, you'll see uh, kind of in the early summer to midsummer. So we start treating when we, they're in the leaf and the bud. But when that bud is fully erupted, we start, we start a treatment. So uh, this is kind of the life cycle here uh, as it's actively passing through. Um, spring and summer symptoms observed. Uh, females, juvenile eggs, and buds over the dormant season. Um, the numbers fluctuate depending on different circumstances. Um, but in late summer and fall, they migrate from the leaves to the buds. So they go back into those buds for the following year. The symptoms, uh, like I said, they appear at bud break. Uh, and they stay the same throughout the growing season. Um, once they cause that damage and the, and the leaf is uh, increasing in size, it seems to be more pronounced. Um, and the leaves kind of take on a leathery type texture. Um, it's best observed from the ground. If you're looking up at the light, you can see the banding uh, very, very easily. Um, the galled cells or the dark banding that we refer to uh, is very apparent. And uh, initially, it'll be mild symptoms. And then uh, as they go through, it'll become more and more, uh, you'll see more symptomology. These are in later years of uh, infection. You get the, dis the uh, distortion, the leaf crinkling, the dying buds, um, hardened leaves after uh, two thirds of the actual leaf is banded. So there's actually a great photograph there showing almost all the symptoms there, a necrosis or uh, browning of the leaf. 
the chloratic banding in between the uh, ribs, the veins, the dark banding uh, toward the outer tips of the leaf, the marginal ends, uh, and stunting or uh, distortion of the leaf. Now this, is, uh, this picture here actually depicts uh, refoliation after the uh, uh, initial leaves had fallen from the tree. Uh, and there's no infection in those there. So if it has enough energy to refoliate, um, those newer leaves won't be uh, infected on the tree. Sometimes we confuse beech leaf disease with some lookalikes, uh, different types of chlorosis, or uh, these are patches from eriophyid mites uh, that feed in a different way, and it's a mite, it's not a nematode. Uh, but whenever we see anything like this on a tree, you know, it, it's got to be something, right? So um, I heard Jack mention in, in his, his uh, presentation, he mentioned the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, uh, and that is one of our best resources in this state to, if, you know, you have something that you're not sure what it is and uh, you don't have an arborist to come over and, and examine it for you, you can send it to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and they will, you know, they have uh, plant pathologists there that will tell you everything you need to know about what you have. They're a great resource. They're actually the first one in the nation, the first agricultural experiment station. There's some, some more examples of uh, this is a different type of um, aphid damage sometimes we see on beech trees where it does cause some of the similar symptoms of leaf curling but uh, in a different manner. You don't see the banding like we see on for beech leaf disease. Uh, it does affect all species of beech, which is unfortunate. Um, but, you know, so that's European, okay, as well as American. And... Um, the most mortality, though, has been noted in American. And these are just, uh, there's a European on the right there. Um, it's because of the different color in the leaf, uh, it's a little bit more subtle in, in terms of identifying it in that leaf, but it can be uh, the symptoms and symptomology is the same. It's just a little harder to see. <clears throat> One leaf can have as many as 10,000 nematodes. Uh, so 10,000 nematodes, you know, get pretty hungry. So, <laughs> um, and then, you know, some, I, I know a research scientist at uh, Connecticut Ag Station actually says sometimes, you know, you see 10,000, sometimes you see 10. So conditions vary. So that's why it's so important that research takes place so we know the best way to approach this uh, disease. It can cause death of mature trees in six to 10 years, and usually the understory trees one to three. Um, and, you know, uh, there would be some species shifts in the, in the forest, in Connecticut forest. Of course, we've had ash, you know, de depletion from uh, emerald ash borer, and chestnuts, as we mentioned, and the uh, oak species due to spongy moth. So um, a lot of species shift going on. But tree energy depletion is likely the cause of death. So depending upon the health of that tree uh, enable the ability to sustain um, repeated defoliation uh, due to this um, plays a, long, a, a role in its survival in the long run. But I want to talk about how we manage it. Essentially, um, some of the things that you can do at home, you can ensure that you have uh, proper irrigation and soil nutrition. Um, if you need a soil sample, they are free at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station. All you have to do is get the sample there. Um, and uh, they also have online resources that you can uh, use to send a sample there. Um, if you have other health issues going on in the tree, you'd want to 
make sure that you're managing for those issues. Remember, the stronger the tree, the more its ability uh, to survive is there. Uh, we use a polyphosphate soil drench now that actually tends, it's a, that's a type of uh, fertilization that we use that actually kind of boosts um, the potential resistance to the damage. Um, and then there's treatment that's undergoing research that we're getting some, some progress with, and that's uh, using some nematicidal uh, property or, or uh, insecticides with nematicidal properties to treat. Um, in Cleveland, uh, the Davy Tree Company and uh, Cleveland Metro Parks are working on a, a uh, five year trial to determine an approach uh, to manage for the disease. And um, essentially, uh, there's foliar applications of uh, fluoropyrin in, uh, broad, in broad form uh, have been used. In Connecticut, we're uh, using a different approach. Um, but um, this is an example where it's showing 80% of the canopy with uh, moderate symptoms uh, on two American beach hedges in Ohio um, after treatments. And so the treatments, uh, the treatment regimen essentially starts uh, toward the end of July and then works through the fall. Usually there's about four or five treatments, uh, a combination of those uh, nematicidal resources and the polyphosphates uh, we're seeing good progress with. So current research, uh, not only being done in Ohio, being done all over. Um, we've got uh, uh, Lynn Carter from the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, in their department in Maryland uh, working on it. Um, David Burke at the Holden, Hold, excuse me, the Holden Arboretum, um, where they're also actually looking at a uh, way to test the genetics uh, and to be able to determine whether or not BLD is in the tree based on the uh, genetics found uh, of the uh, nematode. Essentially a DNA test for the nematode. Uh, other major universities, Cornell in, in New York, uh, USDA Forest Service, uh, Cleveland Metro Parks, Davy, um, Bartlett Research Labs, Connecticut Agri Agricultural Experiment Station, and uh, United States Forest Service. Uh, we're all working on it and taking different approaches into mind, not all doing the same to see which works best. And one of the good things here is that everybody's working together to find that uh, solution. So. With the current research, we're finding that the timing of those foliar applications is important. You know, you're not treating when the insect is not there. Um, and the lower rates of the products are having more uh, consistency. And different products and different methods of application are being tested. You know, injections versus uh, foliar sprays uh, so that we can come up with a, um, a solution. So uh, there are different uh, manuscripts in different areas that folks are, are looking at uh, in terms of new research to be done. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hopeful, okay? Do we have a uh, cure? No. Do we have a solution to slow it down? Yes. Um, you know, the, the future research is going to bring us a little bit uh, more information. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to leave you on a negative note by any means, um, because I, I view research as something in the positive and that we're trying to find out ways to um, be able to sustain you know, what we have. Uh, but no management options, basically BLD is going to be devastating, okay, without any management whatsoever. 
so if you have high specimen beaches, um, you'd want to develop a program to uh, reduce that uh, potential of them succumbing to BLD. So these are some of the things you could do. You can uh, apply the nematode targeting products. You can uh, polyphosphate products to slow down the symptom severity. Uh, soil testing, appropriate uh, fertilizing if necessary. Never do fertilization without a soil test. Uh, and uh, mulching properly uh, and root protection. Uh, those are very, very important. And that's all I have. All questions I'll answer later. Okay. I'd like to uh, introduce someone that most of you already know, Dr. Greg Kramer, Superintendent of Parks and Trees and the Tree Warden for Greenwich. Greg? Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, second time is a charm, isn't it? <laughs> and thank you, Alan, for your introduction. I'm glad we're all able to get together this evening. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about insects and arachnids and then plant diseases as well, because I'd like to cover invasive species on a bigger level and then sort of get into the minutiae a little bit more. So. So basically, I want to talk a little bit about anatomy, um, about what makes an insect an insect, and what makes an arachnid, which would be a spider or a tick, a tick. So what are arachnids, what are insects, how are they different, recent introductions, environmental impacts. Um, the main difference between arachnids and spiders is uh, arachnids have four legs, two body parts, and insects have the three, three legs, or six legs, Two pair, three pairs, and three body parts. And if, if you see here in the presentation, it says they also can have wings and have antenna. Uh, one thing I do want to say that's really interesting about insects as an organism, biologically they're the only organism that has grown wings without losing an appendage. You think of like birds and bats, they've lost their ability, their arms, and so they've given up their arms for wings, whereas insects actually developed wings, which they believe out of breathing apparati, apparati and ma maintained their, their legs. So just a, that's just a quick overview. I didn't want to bore everybody with uh, anatomy. Just wanted to go over what makes them different. OK, this is a scary looking spider, is it not? Well, Jaro spider. I wanted to bring, bring this one into the, the lecture because it's, it's a, rich, a recent introduction. It's, it's prevalent down south um, in the Georgia area, but it's moving. It's on the move. And I'll talk a little bit in, in sort of their adaptation and how they move so quickly, how a spider, which doesn't have wings, can you know, get far distances. Um, that's a female spider. It is venomous, but the, the fangs are, are very weak, so it doesn't typically penetrate the skin. I suppose if it got you maybe between the fingers or something such as that. But um, this is a very brave person. I, I don't think I would do that. But <laughs> it's, if, if everybody's familiar, there, it's an orb spider. So it's very close related to some of the garden spiders you might see in the backyard, the yellow and black ones. And also down south, they have the golden web spiders. I call them banana spiders. So it's very closely related to that one. Um, Here's a, here's a picture of a female and a male in a web. Uh, environmental impacts, uh, we, we don't know yet. Um, but they are seeing a interesting, um, interesting at this point, it's maybe anecdotal, but they're finding that these sp spiders are scaring away or chasing away or preying on native spiders. So there is some in environmental impact. And how they are getting around is, um, when, a, when spiders hatch out of their egg sacs, they, they call what's called ballooning or parachuting, meaning that they shoot their webs up in the air as they're little bitty baby spiders, and it creates a parachute or a balloon, and it whew, wind whisks them off. And they can go very, very, very far distances and go high, high up in altitude. And where they land is a new location. 
So they don't necessarily have wings, but they sure can get pretty far. So they're seeing this happening now, and I think on the next slide, um, no, sorry. Um, it shows, it, I had a slide earlier, I must have taken it off, but where they, they, it shows the distance where they've traveled. And they seem to be traveling north as opposed to south um, and, and a bit more east. So they found them in Maryland and um, I believe also in the DC area and Ohio. So I just wanted to again bring this over his attention because very, in a very short amount of time, I, I think we're gonna start seeing these spiders in our area. So, uh, so be prepared. And, and the webs are rather large, so it's not uncommon for you know, a web to be three or four feet across. It's a, and only one generation, so by the end of the summer is when you'd see the big, the big female adults. The males, as you can see in the picture, are rather small, but the females are rather large, and, and she'll reproduce, she'll pass through the, the frost, will kill her, and then the, the babies will come out in the, in the early spring. So you won't see big spiders until late in the season. Um, here's an interesting character. Uh, this is the new Asian longhorn tick that's been introduced about 2017. Uh, it was first detected in New Jersey. Um, and now it's found from Rhode Island, south to North Carolina, and west to Arkansas. Um, again, native to China, Japan, Russia, and Korea. Um, what's interesting about this tick is it's rather aggressive. So it actually, most ticks will kind of seek out a host, but they do it sort of in a lazy way. They call it questing. They'll sort of sit around and wait for an opportunity to kind of grab onto something moving. This insect, they've actually tested it, and it actually will look for some, something actively. Um, so it's a bit more aggressive. Ticks are interesting, just to kind of go back to insects. They do have a stage where they do have um, six legs um, in, the, in the nymph stage. So it's sort of a strange adaptation and then as they, uh, they grow, then they develop into the, you know, the eight legs. Um, so here are the hosts, it has a wide range of hosts. A, you can see here it's cattle, dogs, groundhogs, deer, of course, foxes, coyotes, geese, owls, and humans. Um, there's large infestations on an, on an animal individually. They tend to be large populations clustered together and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Males, interesting, are rarely found. Reproduction is predominantly by pathogenesis, pathogenesis which is a, it's a form of asexual reproduction. If, you, if you're familiar with aphids, how aphids reproduce very quickly, a female aphid can make babies of herself very rapidly. This, this arachnid is able to do that as well uh, without the presence of a male. So um, if all the population is females, you have a huge population of, of uh, of ticks, so that's something to be concerned about. And it also does carry all the fun diseases that most ticks do. Aren't we lucky? Um, so I'll get a little bit into insects. Um, I, yeah, I hear a lot of love out there. <laughs> um, here's, our, here's our beloved uh, lanternfly. Um, I think this was our first year we truly experienced what they were experiencing in the Philadelphia area and in the New York area last year. So <clears throat> we're seeing a, a, a large population increase right now and I'll talk a little bit how we're managing that. And I would expect to see that in the next couple of years. I was talking a little bit earlier with some of the colleagues that are on this panel and mentioning that I, I have a, an associate in the Philadelphia area who was, so there is light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, they're starting to see a natural decline. So it's not uncommon for these exponential growths in insects and then sort of a crash or, or an equilibrium brought into the ecosystem. Um, but I think we're in for a, a bumpy ride for a couple more years before we maybe see something like that because Philadelphia now, that whole region has been inundated with lanternflies for quite a long time. So this is something we, we may have to get used to. Um, eggs, they, they thought the eggs were brought in on, on, uh, on stone imported from China. Um, and it's currently found in 14 states and spreading quickly. I, I, I do want to talk to somebody who understands a little about epidemiology and, and kind of understand a little bit about this animal's behavior. Again, this is just my own observation anecdotally, but insects and animals, when they get in large populations and large popular clusters of population, they behave differently and I found this insect to be acting very strange, almost as if it was trying to escape and go places. 
because the populations were so high. And this was in New Jersey when I was down here in the summer. And I think we experienced it at Greenwich Point. They were flying every which way they possibly could anywhere to kind of recolonize. They're flying into the ocean. And it just it, it seemed to me very strange behavior, almost like locust behavior. So again, it, it's just an observation. And, and I, I just found it interesting in terms of uh, animal behavior. Because I don't think it would be a behavior it normally would do in a low population. Tree of heaven, I wanted to talk about that. So we're getting into a little more about trees now and diseases. Tree of heaven is a, it's an Asian species. It was brought here as an ornamental, escaped, became invasive. It is the predominant preferred host of, of lanternfly. In its natural habitat, they coexist in Asia, and they go about their business in their normal way. Here, um, we have the host now introduced with the insect, and the insect now is proliferating because we have so much Atlantis tree in, uh, in this region of the country. And if, if, if you look, let's see if, I'm sorry, I'll try the pointer. Maybe this will. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you can really see that. So that Atlantis tree was cut, and you would think, okay, well, the insect's going to move on. Well, it's not because it's still feeding on the stump because it's, the stump still has all the nutrients it needs. The insect isn't sucking. It has a piercing mouth, piercing sucking mouth part. So it's going into the actual vascular system of the tree. It's not looking for sugars. It's looking for proteins to, so it can form its eggs and grow. And um, so what it's doing is excreting those sugars. And what happens is when you get the excreted sugars all over the surfaces, you get the sooty mold. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, that, that dark black mold that develops. You, sometimes you have aphids. Same thing, they're looking for the proteins, amino acids in the plant. They're not, they're not looking for the sugars. So they're constantly pushing these sugars out. So although that tree was cut down, I don't know if it was treated or not. This is not a picture from, from any, any of my work. Um, but it still seems to be supporting these lanternflies. And um, the picture on the right, the Atlantis tree, which they can be quite pretty. Um, this is a female. The Atlantis trees are either male or female. And you can see it's producing new, new seed pods. So um, seems to be the best method of, of controlling um, lantern flies at this point is, is removing Atlantis trees, which is, is a method we're doing here in Greenwich on public property. Uh, so yeah, to talk a little bit more about that, uh, removing Atlantis trees, as what, what the insect does is, and for some reason there's, there's compounds on Atlantis trees that, provo pro that improve its fecundity, its reproductive rates, and it also incorporates, the, the Atlantis trees have toxins in them. So it incorporates the toxins and they become distasteful. And if there's any questions as to why they, they open their wings and have those colors, it's a coloration apposmatism, which it, it, it's a warning. It, it's a learned behavior with animals is they'll eat a, monarch butterflies do that. Um, color, like snakes that have bright colors, um, arrowhead frogs that have bright colors. An animal eats it, learns quickly, either by getting very sick or extremely distasteful, and it avoids it from there, from that point forward. So the insect, and, and that's another reason why they're not so worried. They kind of lumber around because they figure nothing's really going to ever eat them. But, you know, my, again, this is maybe just, you know, a very early observation or just something that I'm thinking about uh, but hasn't been tested yet is if, because they can live on other, other trees. They don't reproduce quite as, quite as well and they don't incorporate toxins if they're feeding on other trees. So if, if that component was removed from the formula, and it, again, it's a learned behavior, if, if animals then figure eating these insects is okay because they're not distasteful, then, then this sort of behavior and this coloration has no merit and, and, it would, and birds would be eating it more often. So maybe you're removing lantus trees and they're reproducing on other trees at a lower rate and without the incorporated toxins, they'd have more predation from, from birds and other animals. Again, just, just some, some thoughts. Um, another disease I wanted to talk about, and I think we need to be on the lookout as, as the climate warms and things are moving quickly on their own and with the aid of, of human 
uh, involvement is, uh, this is something I did a little research on when I was down in Florida, is laurel wilt disease. Um, they're, they're very concerned about it in Florida and California for reasons that it affects trees in the laurel family. Um, here we have sassafras and we have, and we have spice bush that are in the laurel family. So ecologically we have some interest, but they have economical interest because uh, persia americana is avocado. And um, I've, I've lost personally three avocado trees to laurel wilt disease. Um, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insect fungus relationship and it's, it's an Asian beetle that was brought over, they believe in North Carolina, I'm sorry, in South Carolina and Charleston, Savannah area. And the, the, the native red bays, which are red bays, it's an evergreen tree, um, were dying and they, they came to realize that it was an introduced insect. And the insect has been moving north and, and moving west. And uh, I'll show the map in a little bit. And I think we need to be on the lookout. Uh, last year, a colleague of mine called me up and was very, very concerned because they had on their property a uh, sassafras tree that died very quickly and had very similar symptoms that you would see with uh, laurel wilt, which means the tree pretty much dies, holds its leaves, and turns completely brown. And um, I was gonna go out there and, and, and help and do some, uh, some research, but it turned out that um, it was some other, other factor, and they removed the tree before I had a chance to look at it just in case, and I guess they burned the wood. But, um, but I think it's something just we should be aware of. Uh, just, just an interesting side note on the relationship with the beetle and the, the fungus. The beetle actually carries the fungus with it and, and, and inoculates the tree because as the fungus feeds on the cambium, the insect then can feed on the cambium. So as it, it's not a passive action, it's actually an action that's taken by the insect to make sure it has the spores of this fungus as it travels from tree to tree. And so it's, it's quite, quite, a, quite a nice friendship, <laughs> to say the least. There's a beetle, very small. There are native ambrosia beetles. Um, this one is not the native one. A very, very tiny little beetle makes very, very small holes in the trunk and it's, it's barely noticeable until you know, you get a high infect, uh, infestation. Because once one beetle comes in, it sends out pheromones, attracts other beetles, and then they have a party at the expense of the tree. Yeah. Um, just some, some more information on laurel wilt. Again, it, 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 it attacks all of, our, all of our laurel family trees. Um, here again, we have sassafras. Should be concerned about, you know, it, we're talking about all these tree diseases, like what tree doesn't have something inflicting it now? It's, it's very sad. Um, you know, sassafras and spice, spice bush, you know, serve as uh, the host for the, you know, the spice bush swallowtail. Without laurel trees, um, we don't have spice bush swallowtail. But I could tell a quick interesting story. Camphor tree, everybody's familiar with camphor? Um, is an Asian species which coexisted with laurel wilt, so it doesn't kill the tree. You might lose a branch, or you might see some symptomatic um, dieback, but normally they just kind of coexist. And um, one day I was doing some pruning, and I found a spice bush swallowtail feeding on a camphor tree, which to me was very promising because to me it showed an adaptation to a native a native insect feeding on a non-native plant in the family that normally it would need to survive on, but because in red, there's hardly any red bays left in some parts of Florida. Um, so it was very, very great to, it really was amazing to see that. I took some pictures, I documented that. And uh, so, the, so things do adapt. Um, fortunately, they, they don't adapt quite as fast as sometimes they need to, but it was nice to see that a, a native insect was adapting to a non-native invasive uh, species of tree. Um, so here's the kind of the present range of lower wilt. You can see it's predominantly in the southeast and, and kind of creeping up into the mid-south. Um, you know, some of those regions are, are not climatically different than here along the coast. I mean, it's, they're further south, but um, 
they're further inland, so they, they experience cold winters just as much as we do, maybe not quite as long. But again, it's something to be on the lookout um, in the coming, coming years with climate change. Um, so there is a picture of a sassafras, you know, beautiful, always has those mitten, mitten, three different types of leaves, the mitten one, the round one, and sometimes the intermittent one. And I, I don't know if they've actually, I know they've done a lot of research on why the leaves do that, but I don't know if anybody's actually figured out what the adaptation is to that. Maybe it's to, you know, change visual patterns and, and, and hide from herbivory. I, I don't know. Um, so there's our beautiful spicefish swallowtail on tropical milkweed, which is a big no-no if you're a monarch person. Don't plant tropical milkweed. I learned very, very much in Florida never to plant tropical milkweed because it grows year-round. It keeps the monarchs from, from flying south. They become lazy like our geese here. And, and what happens is when the monarchs that do fly south fly back north, they encounter the population that remained. And not only are they learning or maybe unlearning the migration needs that they need to do, the, the local ones that do have diseases then kill off the migrating ones before they get a chance to go north. So if you are going to plant butterfly weeds in your yard, plant the native ones, don't plant the tropical ones. Because even though we have a cold winter here, it's, it's not the native, it's not the native milk, <coughs> excuse me, not the native milkweed for, uh, for our butterflies, our monarchs. So, and to thank you everybody for your, for your uh, hospitality today. Thank you. So I, I believe we're going to sit up here now at this point. Is that correct, John? Test, test. Okay, now, now the handheld mics seem to be on. Okay, great. Is this the song too? <laughs> okay, you guys can hear me. So that was great, you guys. A lot of unbelievable technical information, and um, you're all still here, so that's really good. That's really cool about the city. And sometimes you think about this silent battle that's going on, and um, you know, guys like this are trying to keep it in touch with what's happening. Um, Greg added a few things, Dr. Schumer added a few things to make us realize that the bugs may not be out too, not just the trees. <laughs> um, yeah, the ticks and the spiders, the spiders are horrifying. <laughs> so um, why don't we open up, if you guys have any questions, and we can, um, yes sir, uh, let me get this. Here, I'm coming. Um, yes, I have a uh, large, lovely beech tree uh, that has started to suffer from uh, beech leaf, leaf disease. And I did have it treated once. Um, how long does it take for it to take effect? Or if it doesn't take effect, how long will it take for the tree to die? to that is one of those it depends on a couple of things when it was treated what it was treated with and the condition before treatment um, is it American that you have or European I don't know but it was treated by one okay so um, did they do four or five treatments do you know I, I don't know exactly okay what well, Typically, it was one year, I think it came out maybe twice. Okay. So typically, you know, with the, five, with the five, if you're using the five treatments, they're using a combination of... You, you guys use the mic so they can record. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably turn them. This one's working. Okay. 
So if, if typically there will be four, five applications uh, depending upon uh, some conditions, um, and those will be a combination of products of a polyphosphate and then a nematicide. Um, and um, depending when they treated, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what your particular tree was treated with, but generally what it's, it's going for is for a, um, a slowing of the, the rate of uh, the negative effects from the nematode. So, the, and the, the uh, fertilization portion of it is trying to boost that uh, resistance or, or boost the, the uh, ability of the tree to resist that as well. So it's going to take a few years of treatment uh, to, to see uh, a uh, noticeable result. You know, you're still going to see some symptomology, but you're, you're going to see less of it. Okay, and that's what they're finding in the research. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Thanks, Alan. So just to give you guys all a heads up, it's about 10 after 8. And we're going to go to about 8.15. So really only about five or six more minutes if there's other questions. Um, yeah, up front here. Thank you. Uh, we live in Cuscob, and we have the wonderful combination of uh, the lantern bugs and the trees of heaven. Uh, now, if I'm understanding you correctly, the next step would be to cut them down. Is that correct? Yes. So, is this working? Yeah, okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, the the question is: is it is it good to cut the trees down to control the lantern books? Is that? I'm, I'm asking. Yes. If that would be the number one thing you would. Yes. Suggest. I, I would recommend, if, if you could, um, I would cut down the lanthus trees. Um, for, for lantern flies and also it's an invasive species. Um, but it, it helps to control the population. It, that's, that seems to be the, the best management practice at this point. Okay, to add to that, you showed the slide, one that was caught, <coughs> and the flies were still all around it. At yes. that point, would any kind of spraying help? Uh, you could, you, I mean, if you wanted to. I, I haven't been advocating to spray because um, I don't advocate to spray insect, insecticides if not need be. Um, you could go and, and spray a, like a neem oil or something such as that or concentrated vinegar if you want to do organically. One of those two products would work instead of an insecticide. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, the tree still had enough vitality in it to support the pop. It, it, w it will support the population at that point because it still was alive. But, uh, but that would be my suggestion. I use neem oil for a lot, of, a lot of things, and it works real well. And based on my experience at the Seaside Center um, fighting lantern flies, we actually put Dawn dish soap mixed with water in a spray bottle, and that is very effective at killing the adults. And if you can get your spray bottle aimed, you can shoot them from a distance and they don't jump away. So if you want a nice non-toxic option, um, Don dish soap. Yeah. Absolutely. Kate, I, I think there was one question right behind this lady, uh, right, right in this third row. Hi, um, I was really surprised this fall. We have a lot of trees in the yard, but one tree was just covered with lantern fly as opposed to the others and it was a silver bell. And I was wondering, why would it pick that? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I know they prefer trees with thinner bark because it's just easier to get to the phloem um, for them to feed. So it might have been just because it was one of the few trees in the area that had a thin bark. But that is interesting. I, 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 yeah, that is interesting. As we could, but yeah. I was just really surprised that I picked out this one tree in the yard right, right. as opposed to anything else. Yeah. So I just wondered if there was anything about the silver bell. Nothing I, I'm aware of, but that, that's interesting. I, I would certainly, I'm going to look into more of that because I do know that they will go on native trees. 
but it seems to be trees with thin, with thin bark. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to comment too in that um, kind of directed at the, the previous uh, statement there with the, the spraying of, of uh, dishwashing liquid mixed in does work and it, and it kills by suffocation. It basically closes up the spiracles of the insect, but you need to be careful too that if you get it on leaves of uh, species you want to protect, uh, you could actually, you know, uh, suffocate those or uh, so you need to be careful. Make sure you aim directly <laughs> at, at what you're going for. Okay, behind you. Sorry, uh, two quick questions. One, you made a reference to mulching. Um, how is that beneficial and it would be, is it beneficial for all tree species? And the other question is why is it that invasive species, invasive bugs and, and trees are coming from Asia and landing in our backyard rather than in the west coast first because that's where the jet stream is left west to east. Why, why are we getting them first? Well, you asked some really good questions there. Uh, the first one with mulch. Uh, mulch is really good for a number of reasons when it's done properly. Uh, it helps retain soil moisture, okay? So, you know, especially in situations where we're getting more xeric or, or drought situations, uh, it, it's a very good application that's natural um, and uh, maintains that condition. Um, quite often we see mulch applied inappropriately where it's covering up, you know, root flares of trees or, or uh, buttress roots and actually contacting bark and allowing, you know, pathogens and insects to uh, gain access to uh, portions of the tree that um, either through mechanical damage from wounding and lawnmower damage or something like that is, is going to um, uh, potentially bring the tree into a decline spiral. spiral. Um, with regard to uh, why insects are coming from Asia and, and landing where they do, um, there's an awful lot of reasons that uh, you, they don't just come from Asia, but um, a lot of the ones that we tend to know, um, uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, you know, the trees that we have here adapted to, um, our conditions and our climate, and you know, when it when an insect population comes over, regardless of its method of transport, it basically, you know, has a free meal, so to speak. Um, it doesn't. It has limited predators. It has limited uh, conditions that go against its, uh, um, you know, uh, ability to sustain itself. So. I can't answer, expect <laughs> can, can I take a stab at that a little bit? Sure. Um, Go ahead, John. So this was from sitting in one of these lectures many, many years ago, but it's a, a surprising answer. And if you noticed, a lot of those spreads were around the Great Lakes and around the, um, it's the believe it or not, the auto industry shipping uh, pallets that are infected with insects landing in Detroit and that area. And so, the, the insects are hijacking their way and they're being shipped in wood pallets from you know Asia to Detroit. <laughs> and so <coughs> that that is the epicenter of a lot of where these insects come from is, is they're traveling in the wood pallets. But as Alan said, what's really important to understand about the native species, and you guys all hear so much about natives and natives, 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 and why that's so important, because there's some beautiful Asian plants that we for many years, you know, like to use and like to plant. But what happens, as Alan pointed out, is they have, <coughs> um, you know, no natural, um, the natives uh, have balanced with predators, but when a, a, an Asian species of insect comes, th these, these plants have no natural defenses against them, and so that's why you get these wild explosions of population. So. Um, that's part of the answer, though, <laughs> is, is, is shipping. Um, so we're, we're at now 8.20 almost. Um, I think our hosts here at the library start to um, close up soon. <laughs> so, so I think uh, to be uh, good guests, we should wrap things up. 
Um, sorry if we didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, I'm so thrilled to see this great turnout. And um, thank you for taking it all in, and thank you to our <laughs> panelists. Good night. <laughs>